Yeah, the occasion here has, of course, um, been prompted by my visit to Australia to promote my most recent book, um, The Elephant, the Tiger, and the Self. And I suppose the most useful thing I can do before Geraldine gets here is explain the title. I've had to do this a few times. My first novel was called The Great Indian Novel, and I'm around telling everybody it is not my estimate of the contents of the book, uh, but in fact a, uh, a reference to the principal source of inspiration in that novel, which is the um, ancient Indian epic, the Mahabharata. Maha is great, Bharata is India, and so the Great Indian Novel was a satirical reinvention of this Great Indian epic. But uh, this one, perhaps, uh, requires slightly longer uh, it's the first two thirds of it are fairly obvious. It's sort of uh, an allusion to uh, to India as this sort of lumbering, slumbering elephant of all cliche, you know, mired in its own dust and mud, covered in flies, slow to move, slow to change, which somehow in recent years appears to have acquired the stripes of uh, a sinewy, life and agile tiger, uh, which of course is a reference to the economic transformations of India that have taken place since roughly 1991. But then why is the cell phone in the title, or as you call it here, I guess, the mobile phone? Well, quite simply because, to me, the cell phone is emblematic of this transformation from elephant to tiger. See, when I grew up in India, telephones were, by and large, a rarity and a curse. Let me explain. They were a rarity because there simply weren't very many of them. When I was at university, we probably had 600 million people in the country, with were 2 million landlines. Uh, if you weren't uh, either a wealthy businessman or a government official or a doctor or a journalist, something like that, you could languish for years on a waiting list waiting to get a telephone connection. Uh, in fact, if you were an elected member of parliament, one of the great privileges of being elected to parliament was the right to allocate 15 telephone connections to anyone who deemed worthy. That's how rare. <laughs> uh, but what was worse was if you had a telephone, didn't always necessarily work. I spent my high school years in Calcutta, and sorry, this is this is not a prop. I promise you. I just want to turn mine off. And speaking of my phones, reminded me that I should have urged you all to do it. Anyway, um, so so uh, in Calcutta, in my high school years, my father did have a telephone. He worked for a newspaper, but half the time he picked the phone up, he didn't get a dial tone. If you got a dial tone and dialed the number, you wouldn't necessarily get the number you dialed. In fact, wrong number was a more common expression than hello. <laughs> in fact, when you dialed, you sometimes stumble onto somebody else's conversation. There was even a technical term for it. It was called a cross connection. These were connections that made us very cross. <laughs> then if you wanted to call another city, let's say you wanted to call Delhi from Calcutta, you would book a trunk call and then you would sit by the phone all day long to get that call. Or you could pay eight times the going rate for something called a lightning call, which only took half an hour to come through rather than the minimum three or four hours, if not eight or ten on a trunk call. In fact, when a member of parliament rose in the Indian parliament in 1984, as late as that, to protest the woeful services offered by this public sector monopoly, the Indian communications minister, I'm sorry to say it was a gentleman from my home state, Stephen, replied in a lordly manner that uh, telephones are a luxury in a developing country not a right, that the government had no obligation to provide better service, and that the honourable member was dissatisfied with the telephone service, he was free to return his instrument, since there was an eight-year-long waiting list of people waiting for the telephone. <laughs> now, this was the woeful condition of Indian telephones as late as the mid-1980s. Fast forward to today. Well, not exactly today, because I wrote this book last year, and when I sent it off to the press, I was able to report that some believe that India had just set a new world record by selling 7 million cell phones in the month of April 2007, which was more telephone connections than had been established in any one country at any one time, the US and China included, in the history of humanity. Well, I sent the book off to the press, as I said, and it got printed and bound, and it's available even in Australian bookstores, and that figure is already out of date. Because in December of last year, India sold 8.3 million cell phones. And that's the way it's going now. But what's more interesting, apart from the numbers, which are interesting in themselves, apart from the change of attitude that supplies from the Lordly Communications Minister to a rather enlightened telecoms regulatory authority in India now, which is seen as a model of its kind in the world, is the question of who has these cell phones. Look, if any of you travels to India, you'll probably be driven around, and for good reason, because India is one of those countries where rental car companies charge you more 
to rent a car without a driver than to rent a car with one. Because if you don't know Indian traffic, you're better off being driven. And you can be pretty sure that your driver will be carrying a cell phone. And it won't be one given to him by his company, it will be his own phone. Or you go to visit a friend in a Delhi suburb, the side streets of Delhi suburbs are full of people called Istriwas. These are chaps with wooden carts that look like they were made in the 18th century, using coal-fired steam irons that look like they were invented in the 17th. And their job is to take an ironing from the neighborhood. Uh, and, and you know, these fellows now carry cell phones. Uh, cell phone rates in India are the cheapest in the world, and most plans, incoming calls are free. So once he invests in a phone, he gets calls from all the neighborhood telling him which apartment has ironing for him to take in. Recently, I was in uh, my home state of Kerala, in a uh, rural area about 20 kilometers away from anything you'd consider urban. In fact, it was a uh, friend's farm just dotted with coconut trees. It was a hot day, and my friend said, hey, would you like some coconut water? Because fresh coconut water is the most nutritious as well as refreshing thing you can drink on a hot day in South India. So I said, sure. So he whipped out his cell phone, dialed the number, and the boy said, I'm up here. And we looked, and right on top of the nearest coconut tree, with his waistcloth tied around his knees, a hatchet in one hand and a cell phone in the other, was the local toddy tap. He promptly brought down the, the, the coconuts and gave them to us to drink. And that's what's happening. Fisher folk in, in Kerala or Tamil Nadu now carry cell phones out to see when they've caught their fish. They call up all the market towns on the coast to see which one has the market open and is offering the best price for their fish. And that's where they steer towards. It's, it's been a, a transformation, an empowerment of the Indian underclass in ways that, um, frankly, 45 years of talk about socialism before that uh, simply uh, did not deliver.